dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface characterized by a loss of homeostasis of the tear film and accompanied by ocular symptoms in which tear film instability and hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage and neurosensory abnormalities play etiological roles. I think every single word in that sentence is so important and so key in understanding dry eye and ocular surface. One of my favorite parts of this workshop is this flow chart right here. If you have a presenting patient, we can start on the left side of this flow chart. We have a presenting patient that's asymptomatic and there's no signs, patient is normal, done, right? But if they're asymptomatic and they have signs of ocular surface disease, you're thinking one of two things. One is either stain without pain, which we think of neurotrophic keratitis. And then the other thing that we're thinking of is maybe they have signs without symptoms because they're predisposed to dry eye. They may not feel it yet, but eventually they will. So it's important, obviously, in those cases, if you are suspecting NK, which is neurotrophic keratitis, test for corneal sensitivity. It's really important to try to decipher between NK and dry eye because both of them, they can actually mimic each other and it's important to tell the difference. Then if we go to our symptomatic patients, so symptomatic patients, but they have no signs, we're thinking one of two things, neuropathic pain. So neuropathic pain is something that is managed completely different from the way we manage regular dry eye or dry eye with symptoms and signs. It's very important to identify neuropathic pain because it, again, it is managed differently they're referred for pain management. I have tried fitting scleral lenses on patients with neuropathic pain, and it's been very challenging. I'm not saying it can't work. It, sometimes it could be worth a try, but neuropathic pain needs pain management and needs to be managed differently than regular dry eye that has signs and symptoms. So if a patient is symptomatic, but they've got no signs, it could be that the signs are just not there yet. So it's a preclinical state. These patients need to be treated because they're symptomatic. And for example, if they ever get surgery, or like cataract surgery, for example, then they might develop signs. And so those are the patients that really, really need to be treated, especially if they're having symptoms. And then of course, there's a symptomatic patients with signs. Okay. And then you have obviously the whole list of differential diagnoses. And once you identify dry eye disease, again, you have to identify what type of dry eye disease it is, because there are two different types of dry eye, and actually they can be mixed together. So you have aqueous deficient dry eye and you have evaporative dry eye. Actually, evaporative dry eye is a little bit more common, but again, the etiology might be mixed. So you can have both. And the baseline is once you identify it, the key is management to restore homeostasis. Remember in the definition that you have a loss of homeostasis. So the key here is restoring it. Regardless of if you have aqueous deficient dry eye or evaporative dry eye, it's interesting that the vicious cycle is the same. You either have evaporation of the tears because there's excessive evaporation, like in evaporative dry eye, or you have normal evaporation, but just not enough tears, so low flow. Either way, regardless of its high evaporation or low flow, you have tear film osmolarity, which leads to tear film instability, which leads to inflammation, which leads to all of the, the release of those inflammatory mediators, which leads to symptoms, which leads to signs. And it's just a vicious circle that if it's not treated, it just gets worse and worse and perpetuates. So it's very, very important to get into this dry eye vicious cycle and interrupt it to restore homeostasis. But I think this slide is so important just to show you that regardless of whether it's aqueous deficient or evaporative, the vicious cycle is very similar. And obviously it's important to identify what is the underlying cause or is it mixed so that then we can treat it the right way to restore homeostasis. So just because it leads to the same vicious cycle doesn't mean it's managed or treated the same way. So let's talk about evaporative dry eye disease. So what is evaporative dry eye syndrome could be lit related in which case you're talking about my Bomian gland dysfunction, also abbreviated MGD. It could be blink related, or it could be ocular surface related a little bit less commonly, but we're talking about our mucin layer or a contact lens induced. So evaporative dry eye is something that we think may be age related, but now honestly, we're seeing so many kids with evaporative dry eye with the increase in device use, with the increase of at home work, especially during the pandemic, we've seen a huge increase in 
and dry eye in kids and mostly evaporative dry eye. So is it age related? I don't think age helps, but I don't think we can say that this is something that only affects the elderly or people over a certain age, because I definitely see a lot of kids and adolescents with dry eye. What are some of the symptoms? Itching, burning, watering, redness. And what do we see? Thicken my bum, an increase in SPK, definitely a decrease in tear film breakup time. And then when we look at the my bum in my bombing gland dysfunction, what we're looking at is really a decrease in terpenoids, increase in proteins. And what we see is thicker secretions and plugging of the glands. Another thing that can actually contribute to evaporative dry eye is the biofilm. The biofilm is just gross of bacteria on the surface, on the eyelid margin that can definitely just exacerbate any type of blepharitis, just anterior, posterior blepharitis. And of course, we cannot ignore Demodex. Demodex is extremely common and it's something that is going to be present in so many of your blepharitis patients. So you're probably wondering, okay, this is a scleral lens soiree. Why are we learning about eyelids right now? What does this have to do with scleral lenses? What does this have to do with scleral lens fitting? We can have the best fitting scleral lens on the market, but if you have poor lens surface wettability, which is something that you might see in someone with eyelid issues, someone with blepharitis, then it doesn't matter how your lens is fitting. It doesn't matter what power you have in there. They're not gonna be seeing well. They're not gonna be happy with their vision. The etiology of this is mucoid, lipid, and protein coating on the lens surface. You can see how oily that looks. It just doesn't look consistent. Again, regardless of how centered and stable and nice the scleral lens fit is, you can see that this patient is not going to be happy. They might be uncomfortable. They might experience dryness, intermittent blurred vision. They might say they have to remove and put back their lens on several times a day. Overall, just unsatisfied with their scleral lens. Another thing that we can see is debris in the tear reservoir. So this is caused by fluid dynamics under the lens, which attracts deposits in the tear reservoir. And this can be if the limbal clearance is excessive, of course, we have to take the fit into consideration. And it could also be because there's no tear exchange, which just causes debris accumulation over time. You also have to think of where this debris comes from. Is it coming from the ocular surface? Is there an ocular surface disease that's causing excessive amount of debris buildup? And then that also has to be addressed. This can cause decreased visual acuity, discomfort, inconvenient because patients will report, you know, it just gets foggy after a lot of hours. I have to remove the lens, put it back on. I'm not saying that ocular surface disease is the only culprit for midday fogging, the only culprit for debris behind the lens, but it is something that needs to be addressed. And if you see that your patient's ocular surface is not optimized, it definitely has to be treated in order to optimize the sclerosis lens fit and the scleral lens wear. So it's interesting that we talk about, you know, we have to optimize the ocular surface in order to improve scleral lens wear, but scleral lenses can actually used to treat ocular surface disease. It's very, very interesting. And it's kind of like you have to treat the ocular surface in order to improve the way your scleral lens feels, the vision, the stability, but you can actually use a scleral lens to treat the ocular surface. It's very interesting how intertwined these two topics are. And the TFOS DUES 2 study does talk about the the use of scleral lenses for treating the ocular surface. And so you can see this four plus severe SPK in a 70 year old white female. Scleral lens is like an oasis on the ocular surface. It creates a tear film reservoir, which you can fill with anything from autologous serum tears to regenerize to preservative free artificial tears and even preservative free antibiotic in order to help restore the ocular surface. You can create a cocktail of a treatment that you put on the ocular surface, which just helps restore the ocular surface and improve and heal it and maintain it and preserve it. And you can see the result of that four plus severe SPK, just so much better using a scleral lens after a few weeks. So very interesting, but we still have to treat the eyelid. Okay. So obviously you have the ocular surface disease that we're treating with the scleral lens, but again, really highly have to maximize eyelid health in these patients. And I will never fit a scleral lens on a patient without taking a look up their meibomian gland. And I encourage all of you scleral lens practitioners here to do the same because it is so common, especially today that really, really has to be addressed. Thank you.